What do we want to talk about? What's happened since we talked last? What's happening? Qu'est-ce qui se passe, they say in French. Everything's happening. There's a concentration of events happening in my life at the present time. And I feel like I'm being almost like pulled apart. The, what, what do they say, Denise? What is it? Um, having babies, moving house, getting married. I'm going to interrupt you because I talked to you six weeks ago and you were getting divorced. So <laughs> if now we're getting married and having babies, a lot has happened in six weeks. Um, I have a feeling you don't mean that literally, but maybe you do. I, I, there are, you know, there are no more, there are no more Henry babies. I can assure you that. And sadly, there, are, there are no ladies. But I mean that. I think it. Don't they say that the most stressful events in your life are moving house, getting mm-hmm. married, having babies. Um, so, moving house. So I'm, I'm doing none of those three. But um, as we alluded to, and I think we, with your help, we got closure on sadly the, the divorce the emergence of this divorce. But at the same time, it's concurrent with, I've had this three-year project to construct this beautiful new villa in the on the island of St. Bart's. And you know, it's quite preposterous. It's a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. The logistics are very challenging. And my construction period has coincided with the great inflation. So I definitely feel it. And I'm sitting, I'm, I'm coming to you from said villa. I'm a week away from welcoming clients and if you were to see what's still to be done mm. i mean people i've got agents coming to, to have a look around they're like you ain't gonna make it i'm, like, I'm gonna make it and, and i guess that's part of my character i will make it Is that pattern i mean do you push things to the edge i like, think i yeah. have to do everything in advance i'm an really? advanced, in advance person i've no, always I, been that way i'm the polar opposite mm. I, re- I really have to go over the edge <laughs> and mm. then work and work my way back why is that? Why would I invite chaos into my life? It's uncomfortable. I don't know. Where did the co- when's your earliest memory of it? My husband's like you. It's chaos and it's the last second. I freak out just watching him. I'm really uncertain. I know that with this kind of dialogue, we, we go searching and seeking uh, parallels from earlier periods in life. I feel like, and I mentioned this to you, and I have to be careful because I have this stage persona. I mean, I even have a French name. So I have to be careful. I don't just play the gallery, but I have always maintained that I'm living life in the reverse and that my my earlier life was profoundly and almost in, in straight and orderly and ambitious. This stage of my life is almost the inverse. And it's almost perhaps as if I'm saying to myself that I owe myself that chaos owing to just being so strict. If you were me, you would have taken the the year or two or five and been the ski bum after college or being like the the beach bum sort of. Mm, To get out of your system, yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't do it either. Yeah. So let's go backwards because I am sure that your listeners would find it odd that you were exceptionally straight in your 20s or in your younger years. Yeah, really in the younger years, the teenage years, the very strict. So uh, you're telling us that the kind of wild Hugh Henry we now know crossed the T's, dotted the I's, followed the rules, did his homework, showed up at school. Yeah. Really? I, I would have been with you in submitting that exercise for the Whatever press. It was, yeah. Um, uh, anything else would be tantamount to failure. I was on a mission not to fail. So maybe you just you've earned not playing the game. Yeah, that, that's indeed. But at the same time, however, there is a question mark, a kind of not in my mind, which is, do I pull out the chaos card um, to bring things down? So you've made all this money. You're living in St. Bart's as a result of that. You've taken on these projects related to living quarters, which is interesting given your personal history and the relevance of living quarters. Heavens, do I have light bulbs behind me? Uh, they're all beginning to, to go off in my mind. Um, I could relate this actually to, and I'm sure we mentioned this last time, uh, a pivotal moment in my childhood. I think I'd have been ages of 10 or 11 or so. And my my parents secured 
a mortgage to buy their public housing stock. We think nothing of that today, but actually that was 40 years ago. And my parents had never conceived of having either the right or the financial ability uh, to take on such a liability. And it changed all of our lives. My father took on extra, he was a truck driver and he took on a longer distance. My mother had been a housewife and she took on a job. I was given preposterously silly uh, house cleaning duties. And I had a staff of one, which was my younger brother. And I really took it as seriously as you committing to that project. And I think I was forced to grow up a little bit too quickly. And I think maybe it took a little bit of affection out of the whole dynamic in the family because we were otherwise occupied. You fast forward to the present and I'm saying, God, I wouldn't mind a few pennies more because I'm desperately anxious of the fact that, yeah, I've got like 8 million bucks of debt. I, I want to take on more. <laughs> the Europeans have this preposterous, especially the French, where you have to pay amortization. You've got to repay a fifth of the loan every year. Oh, uh, whose idea was that? Wow. I, but I have to ask you something before you, yeah. how old were you? I mean, I sort of know this, but I'm going to ask since we're talking directly. Like when that whole, when your parents got the mortgage, how old were you? Let's say 10. Oh. Young. In other words, just as if you're about to be a teenager, you have to become a version of an adult. That's it. That's what happened. you wonder happens. why you're living. <laughs> you wonder why you're traipsing around saying. Well, there you, there you go. Um, with, 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 you're literally traipsing around saying bars sort of fun might be your priority, let's say, like it might be for a 12 or a 14 year old. But oh, by the way, you've added this housing stress. Yeah. Uh, at, that, at that early age, the precedent was take on uncomfortable projects, like move forward, you know, aspire to be greater and grow up. I persuaded myself to swap the, the fun or the craziness of adolescence for the promise of something more enduring, something better, not knowing, just knowing that there was something better. And so you ask me, you say to me, you know, give me the cranky stories, the crazy things you did uh, when I was young. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I, I actually relate to this in a crazy sort of way. And now I live in Park City. So yeah. Um, And I spend my time, I literally with the divorce thing. And I mean, in reality, I've, I've stopped paying the lawyers. First of all, you know, divorce lawyers are just preposterously expensive. I spent 150,000 bucks and it's not obvious why I've spent that. But, you know, I've, I've thought, I'm just like, you know what? I'll represent myself. I cannot bear this. I'll tell you another time, quite funny. I was sent to America. I was in charge of, well, not, forgive me, I was not in charge of, but analytically, I want to say at the age of 24, um, at, at an Edinburgh investment manager, I was transferred within the offices of Edinburgh to the American department and, and sent to the U.S., and sent to California. Typically, the broker picks you up and drives you around, and that didn't happen. I had one day where I rented a car. I'm, I get my manic mind. I, I cannot drive. Cannot drive long mm. distances, and I can't find places. I drive in St. Bart's, uh, but you know. But driving in a foreign city where you don't even know where you're going. Who? I had to drive a car, and I was that trip. You know, it was Silicon Valley. The boy from Edinburgh went to Silicon Valley right at the very beginning in 1994. And it felt like that Woody Allen movie, the one which is set in the future, which is, I think is famous or infamous for having the orgasmatron. <laughs> you know, it looks like a public loon. You go in and you get kind of, you come out feeling better. It was his impression of the future. And anyway, it struck me that it was like, oh my God, there was no, I went, I was always late common trait and the campuses are enormous i dump the car somewhere i'm just dumping the car off i work it out on foot i'm running through not gardens but like office gardens you know presentational thing you know grounds the, manicured, the bay area and those office yeah, parks yeah manicured grounds and it was almost like to the members of the older members of the audience fed as day off and i'm running through it. i'm trying to get by and 
they had been sprinkling this garden bed and oh it was really wet and my foot disappeared oh, i lost gosh. my shoe and then fished it out and I, I kind of washed it with the sprinkler put it with this wet shoe back on i was visiting adobe adobe and i just i should just have bought the damn company in what oh and you literally this is like a research trip visit it's a research trip and oh and back then the institution their total so in a global portfolio they're U.S. equity allocation was three percent. Three percent. And the world was going to be two percent of your three percent. So it, yeah, in, indeed. So the following day, I said to the broker, "Get me a damn car and a driver." Right. And and then so it's like a limo. And you have to remember, I was working for this very austere, very very good, but austere investment management group. Um, the type with the the very deep pockets, but the very short arms, and so they never quite they never quite get there, you know. And I was just like, oh my god, how much is this costing? And I went to visit Intel, and I'm s- sitting there taking notes, asking questions, but my mind is all in a fog because all I can think of is like a taxi meter. But you're between, worried between. about the money. The worried about the money, and I literally had to run out and say, "You're cancelled." You know, I'll get back to San Fran another oh, way. I'll hitchhike. So you grew up, obviously, with the feeling that there wasn't enough money or there's a strong possibility that there might not be enough money. I guess that resonated, that fear emanated from my... Now opinion. you somehow put yourself in a situation where you feel like despite the extra zeros, there might not be enough money. Yeah. That's not I, an accident. Yeah. And I always have to invent it. You know, so I produced a cash flow statement for the property business and I was speaking to the lawyer saying, Yeah, we we've, we've got to rein this in. And and they looked at it and said, It looks okay. I'm like, what? I, I literally had I had blindness. It is true that the the brain, we're always predicting what's gonna happen. First of all, we're always predicting the future. Everything is a prediction, but it's a prediction based on what our past experience is. And the most important past experience is certainly in the first 20 years of life, more in the first 10 and then in the first five. If you grew up feeling like there wasn't enough money, you're going to put yourself in situations where you feel like there's not enough money. So that causes you stress now that's probably not real. It's an invented stress, arguably. Yeah. It's about remembering what it felt like then, you know, going back. One has to have the memories, feel how it felt then, and the feelings about the feelings. That's actually the most important part. And then you resolve it and you don't have to repeat it. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, that austere Edinburgh business was a little bit like my, it was austere like my childhood. And I pretty much flunked. Yeah, I was there for eight years and it didn't work. And it's funny that the pivot really was moving to London and and meeting this extraordinary character, good and bad, flawed and a genius or whatever, the kaleidoscope of life who literally sat me down and said, I'm going to teach you how to misbehave. I'm going to literally, it was almost a bit like the rewind. Let's go back to being 10 and let's be curious about mm-hmm. things. We didn't delete the the RAM, the computer memory. It was actually, is there permanently. Well, you can't really delete it then. But... but I've written over it. And so now I, I feel like I'm a compass of the two. So, you know, I give out. This, you know, like like you said, here you go. I'm, I'm in St. Bars in the pursuit of fun. If you were to follow me around my daily life, it's kind of similar to that 10 year old. You know, I. You're not surprised me when I. Uh, I studied the fact that people repeat things before I ever came into to trading officially. I mean, as it turned out, in retrospect, my dad had been an, a buy and hold investor and talked about the stock market all the time. So later on, I realized, wait a minute, in a way I went into the family business, but I didn't at the time, I didn't know it and I didn't plan on it. And then I got involved in long short equity trading and ran a trading desk. And then someone wanted to publish my master's thesis, which was about how we repeat things. That ended up with me coaching people. I did not expect to find people projecting these repetitions onto the market. And I did. I thought we only did it in our personal lives where we got ourselves into a situation, strangely with housing, where it makes us feel strapped for cash, just like you felt. 
But what came to be is people will just take the market as an authority figure and they project whatever they want onto it. I could give you story after story after story. People have these experiences growing up. They learn that this is the way to deal with life. These are the problems of life. This is the thing that might happen. Terrible thing might happen if they don't. And they project it all into what the market does. Now, we haven't talked about that with you, but I use it as an illustration of how pervasive the inclination to repeat is. Freud did call it the compulsion to repeat. Now, the neuroscience knows that your brain is just expecting a current situation to be like a past situation. It's just the fundamental mechanism of perception and judgment. So we see things through an outline or a template that we interpret it that way. And then because we see it that way, we behave a certain way. And then it literally does create the same situation, at least. Hi, this is a fake voice generated with AI. Those of you who are not patrons, your ride is over. To see the rest of this video, join the tribe and subscribe at patreon.com slash Hendry. Patrons, brace yourself and please keep your hands and feet in the vehicle at all times. Thank you and now back to our normal programming.